So I think what we'll do first here is just give you a sort of general introduction to the whole series this summer. Uh, and I want to start with an image, which is really a story of St. Dominic. So St. Dominic was a fairly introverted, um, quiet, contemplative young man. And it wasn't until after he was ordained a priest, and he accompanied his bishop through France, that he had this turning point in his life. And this turning point came when he met an innkeeper, an innkeeper who had been, whose life had been completely changed by this radical error, this radical falsehood he, he learned. And he'd become a, a deacon in a sort of uh, separate <coughs> church. He'd become, uh, the, the name of the group was Cathars, or Albigensians. So St. Dominic was moved to compassion at this man and seeing all of the uh, things that had been destroying his life, all of these errors and falsehoods that had been destroying his life. And so he stayed up the whole night, rather than you know, sleeping like you usually do in a hotel. He stayed up the whole night arguing with the innkeeper, trying to, to point out the errors in his life and trying to show him the truth and the beauty of the gospel. And in a biography of St. Dominic's reported that by morning, this innkeeper was no longer able to resist the wisdom and the spirit with which St. Dominic spoke. And he returned by God's grace to the true faith. So this, uh, this story is sort of, I think, central in, in the Dominican heart because we see our Holy Father Dominic having compassion on the ignorant and enlightening them with sacred truth and the gospel, and, and staying up the whole night, being willing to talk to this man, persuade him. But I think there's something curious. We don't exactly know what they talked about specifically. So I think it's a, it's a nice point for meditation to think, what was that conversation like? One of the priests of our provinces thought about dramatizing it in a play before, but him commenting on that made me, made me think, well, what would that conversation be like? What did they talk about? if it was so important both in this innkeeper's life and in St. Dominic's. Well, I think we can say that St. Dominic used reasonable arguments and went right to the problems and spoke about the beauty of the faith and showed forth the splendor of the truth. And we get a hint of that, saying that the man was no longer able to resist the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. So that's sort of what we're trying to do this summer. This summer, we'll be going right to the heart of the matter in some problems, some key issues, some things that people often have misconceptions about. And so the title of this series is From Stumbling Blocks to Wisdom, Overcoming Obstacles to Belief with the Dominican Saints. Now, the title, you might catch, comes from uh, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians, where he speaks of the cross as a stumbling block for some and as foolishness for others. But ultimately, we're able to move to a sense of wisdom. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So this summer, what we're going to attempt to do in these talks is move from what at first sight appears to be stumbling blocks and move and try to open up and use these as occasions for coming to wisdom, the true wisdom of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, given as a gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to focus on important questions, go right to the problems, use reasonable argument and the lives of our Dominican saints pictured here to illuminate the truths of the faith, and to solve some of these problems. 
And so each talk will have three parts, basically. We'll set up a problem, then we'll have a sort of theological clarification, what does the church really teach in response to this problem? And then offer the witness of a Dominican saint, his life, his or her life, we have, we have Dominican saint women here too, as a way to illuminate the teaching, to animate it. Because I think stories and, and witnesses of, of people's lives, the way when the, the teachings really come to life is when we see them embodied in these people. So tonight we approach the question, what is the meaning of life? Or to put it personally, why am I here? Now for some, this is a stumbling block because they can't quite articulate it. And for others, this is foolishness because they don't think they can presume to know the meaning of life. And so, I've left Brother Joe Kim with the fun part of this talk, that is setting up the problem. And so he's going to speak about all of the problems in approaching the meaning of life. So as uh, Brother Raymond said, the, um, the topic tonight is, does life have meaning? Uh, and we're going to examine the witness of the life of St. Peter Martyr. Um, just want to begin, there's a, a well-known quote from the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle that says that all men by nature desire to know. Uh, children especially are often noted for their inquisitive dispositions. Now, those of you here who have children, uh, can think back more or less fondly, I'm sure, uh, to the times that they've decided to play 20 questions. Um, they can come up with some pretty strange ones now and then, uh, but I think that there are certain questions that every child asks, and asks not just once, but throughout his life. Uh, one such question is, why am I here? Uh, does life have any purpose or meaning? As we move from childhood into adulthood, this simple query consumes more and more of our attention. We are, as we are faced with life's major decisions, we wonder what the meaning of them are. Uh, increasingly today, some even doubt that there's any meaning to life at all. Now, this fundamental human question has elicited a range of responses throughout history. Uh, to no surprise, it generally varies according to the worldly or the religious outlook of the responder. Dominican father, Reginald Pierre de Lagrange, uh, in his book, The Last Writings, lists three of the world's typical replies. First, he says that there are those who think that the goal in life is enjoyment or pleasure. These are the hedonists uh, who are constantly pursuing the fleeting pleasures of the senses. Secondly, he says there are some who pursue their own self-interests and control of others. We can sum this up as the pursuit of power. The third response that the world gives might at first not sound so far off. He says it is that some people have the goal of fulfilling one's individual and social duties. Um, we know that from, from our Catholic faith, we know that there's often an emphasis placed on obligation and on duty. Um, but in this form that, he, that Father Lagrange is talking about, he says that it arises from the ancient Greek philosophy known as Stoicism. Uh, which placed an emphasis on self-control and on achieving virtue by sheer human effort and strength of will. Um, in addition to these three replies that Father Lagrange gives, uh, yes? Excuse me, brother. Sorry for the interruption. Can you speak just a little bit loud, please? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so there's two other uh, replies that we can see that people in the world today have. Uh, one of these we can call the agnostic approach. And this is the claim that it is impossible to know whether there is any purpose to things or not. Uh, some insist that even if there were a goal to life, it is impossible to know what it is. Uh, a second and perhaps more challenging claim comes from uh, people who are known as the new atheists. For example, Richard Dawkins. They claim that there is no innate meaning to life or anything in nature. Uh, in general, they say that things have come to be as they are through the random forces of evolution. <laughs> Dawkins says that any purpose that we see in life is the result of humans imposing it on nature. He says, quote, 
We reach out in our search for meaning until we suddenly realize that it is we that actually provide the purpose in the universe that would otherwise have none. End quote. In other words, he says, it depends on us to come up with our own meaning and our own reason to live. Uh, so in answer to this, we're going to take a look at the life of St. Peter Martyr uh, to see if they, we can't find an answer to this. Uh, St. Peter spent his life as a Dominican friar working for the conversion of the same Cathar heretics that Brother Raymond uh, mentioned St. Dominic was trying to convert. Uh, he lived in northern Italy. Uh, now, Cath Catharism uh, was a heresy that believed in two gods. There was a god of evil that created and governs all material things, and a god of good who created all spiritual things. The Cathars believed that all material things are evil, including our bodies. So they thought that our souls were imprisoned in our bodies, and that the purpose of life was to free our souls from our bodies uh, by practicing austerity to the utmost extreme. Uh, so now I'll turn it back over to Brother Raymond. Uh, we will try and answer this question. Thank you, Brother Joachim, for giving me many problems to approach now. Uh, I just want to preface this. Some of these obviously sound very deep. And I think there's a tendency we have to shy away from deep questions. But I really think deep questions are accessible to all people, because all people can't help but ask some of these questions. So Leslie John Ball II spoke this in, uh, in one of his encyclicals. He said, you know, there's a sense in which all people are, in some sense, inevitably going to be philosophers. So they're going to inevitably ask philosophical questions at some point. I think we can distinguish this from a technical approach, where we get bogged down in specific language. And that might be set aside for professional philosophers or something. But I think that asking and attempting to answer deep questions is something accessible to all, even if the technical language isn't accessible to all. In fact, I think there's some philosophers for whom, uh, who avoid the deep questions and just offer a facade of technical language to pretend like they're doing philosophy. So we can actually go further than the philosophers. We certainly can do, can do that with faith. So I'm going to offer a few responses to the problem set up by Brother Joachim from the standpoint of reason. So not even beginning to speak of what we know from God's revelation, but just using the natural light of reason that God has given us, we can, we can even clear up some of the difficulties presented, um, just presented by Brother Joachim. And so uh, what do I mean by reason? I just mean this natural light that God has given us. And I think it's appropriate in solving these problems to use reasoned arguments and especially to clear away some of the obstacles, um, sort of clearing the brush that allows faith and, and allows the proper understanding to, to spring up. Because oftentimes, error, falsehood, is cloaked in uh, a seeming guise of truth. Um, and so, if we just go through one by one, one, by one um, quickly, looking at some of the arguments, we can see that, that they can't quite hold water. So, is the meaning of life pleasure? Well, not quite. You can think of this um, quickly in terms of we want something big, we want something infinite, and pleasure always comes in small, isolated, singular instances, right? But because of our soul, we have this craving for something more, something unlimited, something infinite. And so, pleasure is not looking very uh, promising then. Power, control over others, also, um, it comes and goes. And it's also something that we only have as an ability. We don't actually experience in, in, in full actualization, um, even if we do have some power. Um, social duties, well, we know that, yes, we do have certain obligations, especially obligations to the Lord, but that can't be the end. Uh, that can't be the ultimate purpose. Wealth, well, you could talk about two types of wealth. Wealth that we have... Um, in terms of money, which is sort of an artificial wealth that only has value in as much as it's given value. Or you could talk about natural wealth. Um, so, like, um, just goods in themselves. So things we get, um, let's say food, let's say clothing, um, anything, any sort of thing we need. Well, neither of those is going to be our ultimate purpose. 
um, artificial wealth really is just a means to natural wealth, and natural wealth just helps us sustain our bodies, but we're worth more um, than just merely our bodies. And, okay, so those are some, went through those quickly, you can kind of set those to the side. Maybe a more difficult one to approach is, is, the, is the response that there is no meaning to life. Or, if there is one, we can't know it, we can't presume to know um, Or, even as we probably is more um, popular today as a result of some modern philosophers and as a result of some modern scientists, we create the purpose to life. We create the purpose to life. So there is nothing there, but because we as human beings need to do something, need to, need to feel satisfied in some way, we, we make it up. We make up our own. Um, and so that's one that's gained sort of uh, popular support at times. Um, but we don't, uh, this, this can't quite be, um, even from the standpoint of reason, even from, from working on our, our natural light of reason alone, we could, we could come to know that these don't hold water. And so, I think in particular, um, Aristotle is, a, is an excellent guide to what we can know by reason. And he offered, um, in one of his works, offered this thought that happiness is the end of man, right? Happiness is our purpose. We, we desire to be happy and to rest. And so, happiness, it's an activity uh, in accordance with the highest excellence, the best thing in us. And this is a quote right from him. So we should strain every nerve to live in accordance with the best thing in us. Well, what's the best thing in us, the highest thing in us? Well, it's, it's the God-given gift of the intellect. We, as, as rational animals, as human beings, are separate from, from all of the non-rational animals we see in the world. And so whatever our end is, it has to do something with that. And so Aristotle is able to sort of point to that and say, our end has to be something about contemplating God using our intellect. And so he gives us kind of that basic rudimentary answer for reason. And so if we have this, um, if we only had this, we've been able to be know, to, could we could possibly know God as the supreme creator and governor, but not yet as father or friend. <coughs> and here's a quote from uh, Gerlou Lagrange as well, who Brother Joachim also used in his setting up of the problems. So, if left to reason alone, we would only be able to know that God would have been for us the first cause of the universe, the intellect that governs all things. And we could have loved him as the author of nature, with a love that exists between an inferior and a superior, but there wouldn't have been any intimacy, only admiration, respect, gratitude, with that gentle and simple, uh, there would, excuse me, there would not have been any intimacy. Um, and so, no familiar friendship, no participation in the inner life of God. We would have been only servants and not sons of God. So the main point in, in this little philosophical excursus <coughs> right now is to say that even by reason alone, we could refute a lot of these modern errors. So we could also come to a rudimentary understanding of life's meaning and in some sense of contemplation. So I think that's very important because doing a little bit of this philosophical work, even though it can be kind of technical and can kind of bog us down at times, it helps us to receive the faith all the more um, apt to be disposed to receive it with open arms and an open mind. Okay, now I'd like to move on to the answer, the complete answer we get about the purpose of life from revelation and faith. So, uh, what are revelation and faith? Before I say that they give us an answer, we should talk about what they are. So, revelation, we can simply understand as God revealing himself to us. God telling us about himself. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, that big green book that every Catholic family should have, um, begins with this quote. I think it's beautiful. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man. He wasn't forced to make him. And to make him, and he made him to share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time, in 
every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, and to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men, scattered and divided by sin, into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son as Redeemer and Savior. In his Son and through him, he invites men to become, in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children, and thus heirs of his blessed life. So here, in one paragraph, we have a summary of salvation history. We have a summary of uh, this beauty of the faith that all of the pagan philosophers, all of the ancients, were unable to reach in all of their study. They were unable to reach these simple truths that we can articulate now and hold faith in. And I think it's moving back to, to what is revelation. We can understand revelation as a sharing in God's own knowledge of himself. So God reveals himself to us. Christ speaks of the Father. He speaks of himself as Son and speaks of the Holy Spirit. God reveals himself as a trinity to us, which is celebrated Trinity Sunday, so we have some of those ideas fresh in our mind. So we need to understand this great gift. We need to understand Revelation as a great gift because it's God giving us a sort of share in his own understanding of himself. Now, that's Revelation. What is faith? Well, faith is our response. Uh, and to, to quote the Catechism again, just to get, just to get the, the doctrinal points fastened down, faith is man's response to God, who reveals himself and gives himself to man. At the same time, bringing man a superabundant light as he searches for the ultimate meaning of life. Ah, there we have our phrase, our key phrase, as if we were just trying to, you know, look up a topic and look at that, it's in the catechism. It's relevant enough to be in the catechism, believe it or not, the meaning of life. In fact, some of you probably remember the old Baltimore Catechism where that was one of the first questions. What is the meaning of life? So, well, and, and the immediate response, you memorized or got was to know, to love, and to serve God, so as to be happy with Him here and in the next life. So basically what we're trying to do in this lecture is sort of unpack that. How do we come to know that? And what exactly does that mean? So, faith is our response to God, but mysteriously, it's only possible with God's help. So, revelation is God showing himself to us. Faith is our response. But even that response, as all of our actions, but in a special way, supernatural action, faith, requires God's help. And so I think an image to, to help us understand this is, um, many of your parents, I'm sure uh, at one point or another, you've been given a gift um, by your child, by some of your children, that was basically something you already gave to them. Or you gave them the money so that they could go out and buy you a gift, right? So. Um, you know, we might look at that and say, well, that's, uh, what is that? It doesn't have any meaning, you know, you know, you paid for it, it's not really a gift. But I think as a parent, you know, you, you recognize the, the beauty in that because your child's been given something and, and he wants to give it back. And so if that's the relationship between child and parent, well, how much more is, is the distance between God and us? And how much more do we need his help? to adequately respond to his gift. So I think that's a, that's a good way to, to help us understand how, while faith is our response, it's something that's a grace, it's a gift from God that enables us to respond to him. Um, that's speaking of faith, speaking of love, in the letter of St. John, John says it's not so much about um, us loving God, but that he's loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sins. So that's a little bit about revelation and faith and their meanings. So why is faith necessary? Why is faith necessary for us to come to this full understanding of the meaning of life? Well, by faith, the big questions, which could be to some obstacles and challenges, are changed into big answers. Okay, so that's a, a quick way of saying it. But I think it's, it's, a, it's a way that captures the heart of the matter. 
So faith allows us to get the big picture, to get the full vision of life. And, and this full vision is attractive, right? So when we talk about dealing with those who don't accept the faith, or those that don't accept, let's say, the authority of Scripture, or the authority of the church, we might feel like we can't talk about those things at all with those people. And we just have to start on what we have in common. And it's true that we need to start where we have common ground. Um, we need to start with, uh, you know, maybe some, some principles that we hold in common. But that doesn't stop us from showing them the big picture, the beauty of the big picture. So even if they don't accept one or more elements of that big picture, the picture of the faith as a whole is attractive. And I think that's exactly what brought this innkeeper, whom St. Dominic debated with all night, I think that's what brought him to conversion, seeing this beauty of, of the truth. And I think uh, one image, I asked Brother Joe, was, well, how, how do I express that in an image? Because that's kind of abstract. Um, he's like, well, how about like a pocket knife? I was like, yes. <laughs> so a pocket knife, let's say you're trying to sell a pocket knife to someone. Maybe it's an infomercial or something. And really, this person just needs a knife. I mean, I just need a knife. I'd be happy with a knife. You know, and one that just, you know, clips up in my pocket. Uh, and, and that's all I really need. I don't need those little scissors or that cork screw or a um, bottle opener or whatever else they have on their cell phone. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, if you're selling that, even if the person's like, no, 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 I only need a knife. Is that going to stop you from telling them about all the cool features of it? <laughs> um, I don't think so at all. And in fact, that might make it more attractive. I think it will. To see the complete picture, the complete package. To use another image, another analogy for myself from music. Um, so music has a number of different things going on at once. Let's say you're playing saxophone solo, like I did a lot in high school. So you have to keep track of rhythm, of dynamics, of tone, of pitch. Um, notes on the page, all these different things. And so you learn by getting good at one of those at a time and sort of letting it become second nature to you. So you have to kind of add one at a time. So when I had saxophone lessons, private saxophone lessons, my, my teacher would often just, no, 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 let me play through that. You know, let me just, just show you what it's supposed to sound like. Uh, you know, so don't worry about all these elements. And so he would play, you know, excellently, because he was a very good player. Um, and I would say, okay. And even though all the things were presented at once, and even though I wasn't able to, to grasp and immediately imitate all of them at once, it would, it would learn, it would, uh, it would allow me to learn one or more of those elements, um, you know, focusing on it one by one. But still, the big picture is attractive. And I said, well, okay, that's what I want to sound like. That's what it looks like. That's the goal. So this is, uh, those are images to help us understand why it's important to present the big picture and to be able, in a moment, to present the big picture. As St. Peter says in one of his letters, be ready to give an account of the hope that is within you. So we ought to be able, when someone asks us um, about one or more teachings of the church, particularly because people will tend to focus on one or more moral issues and say, well, the church is just about telling you what to do or not to do, and in particular, this one issue. And say, whoa, 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 let me tell you about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us and the life we have available through him. So, this is all under, why do we need faith? Also, faith enables us to know with ease and with certainty and with no error mixed in. Those things that, uh, let's say, the ancient philosophers could only know after a long time, those who were professional philosophers who spent all their time in leisure thinking, could only know after a long time, and not with absolute certainty, and with a lot of errors mixed in. So. The simplest person, all people, are able to know these transcendent truths immediately and, and, and through a life uh, lived in receiving the faith. And so uh, another reason uh, why we need faith to come to a proper understanding of the meaning of life is otherwise we would be persuaded, uh, according to our likes, um, as we often are, to believe that what we want to be true is true. So let's say um, let's say we want we take one or more of our hobbies and, and, and say that that is the meaning of life for me and, and you know it's like you have to pick up you have to kind of pick your own and um, and, and pick one or more of those I don't know maybe you have, like uh, let's say someone's really into 
making like remote control cars or something like that. I don't know. I'm drawing on my 14 year old analogies too. Um, so another way to understand the importance of faith is what we gain by the natural light of reason is sort of like one light, a, a flickering candle, like a votive candle over here, let's say. But what we gain by faith is like a spotlight, one that illuminates the whole. So those are, those are some things that help us understand why faith is necessary for us to come to a proper understanding of the meaning of life. Now, what exactly, you say, okay, this is a lot of introduction, but what is the meaning of life? What does faith tell us about the meaning and purpose of life? Well, like I said, you've got the, the standard go-to Baltimore Catechism answer, to know, love, and serve God, to be happy with Him here and in the next life. So we need to kind of unpack this, because there's a lot there. The purpose of life is to be eternally happy with God and to share in His own divine life in communion with the Blessed Trinity. Uh, I'm going to rely on another quote from Pierre de Lubrache because he articulates it very well. Our true end, according to Revelation, is to know God as He knows Himself, to see Him face to face as He sees Himself, directly and not through creatures. God was in no way obliged to grant us participation in his intimate life. But he could do so, and through pure mercy wished to do so. So I think some of these statements are important for us because we can often have a sense of entitlement. Um, but we need to recognize that we're utterly dependent on God. He, did not, he was not obliged to make us, and he was not obliged to, to give us a share in his own divine life. These are all gifts. Your graces. And so, I think there's a, a little bit of, of what is the meaning of life, just what we know by faith, right there. But is faith all it's about? <coughs> is faith the answer? Is faith the absolute end? Well, no. Because as we know, faith gives way to sight. So, going back to the, uh, the image of the light, of the candle and the spotlight, let's say that if that's what, if, if the candle's natural light of reason, and if the spotlight's what we know by faith, and sort of as a reflection here on earth, well, in the beatific vision, it's like looking into the sun. <laughs> it's like being right in front of the sun. To be able to have a vision of God directly, face to face, and God himself enables us to be able to see him as he is. It's a marvelous thing to continue to contemplate and to continue to ask, what will that be like? But faith here on earth gives us a foretaste, a reflection, like I said. And to draw another quote from the Catechism, faith makes us taste in advance the light of the beatific vision, the goal of our journey here below. Then we shall see God face to face as he is. So faith is already the beginning of eternal life. I remember that, that truth hit me, struck me powerfully. In, in Italy, when I was listening to this one homily, and not being very good at Italian, listening, there was one thing I picked up, and it was this, this excellent preacher, and he said, e vita eterna comincia adesso. Eternal life begins now. I said, yeah, that's true. And now we can understand it in the right way. So by faith, eternal life begins. When we contemplate the blessings of faith, even now, as in gazing at a reflection in a mirror, it is as if we already possessed the wonderful things which our faith assures us we shall one day enjoy. Now, at this point, it would be legitimate to accuse me of not talking about our Dominican saint at all yet. Um, so I thought this was a lecture on the saints, and you're giving me all of these quotes from the catechism and, and all of these things, and, and, and what does this have to do with St. Peter Martyr, and why is there a big gash in his head? Um, as you see here. Well, today, as you, as you may know from going to Mass today, is the Feast of St. Peter Martyr, who's one of the early and great Dominican saints. Um, and so I want to give just a few facts about his life that might help us to, um, well, approach the meaning of life. So, all martyrs are a witness to faith, but I think Peter Martyr is in a particular way. So his early story... He was raised by parents who were themselves Cathars, Albigensians. They were, they were 
They bought into this heresy of dualism. But, they, so they either believed it themselves or they were sympathizers. So <coughs> Peter Martyr grew up, um, rather than going to catechism on Sundays, probably uh, hearing all of, these, all of these errors, all these false teachings um, spoken or taught to him in the house. But, thankfully, as a special grace, he was sent to a Catholic school, a school run by, by non-heresies, by Catholic. And uh, so he received sort of proper instruction there, and he absorbed it. It was beautiful and attractive, and he absorbed it. And so there's this excellent story of him coming home from school one day, and his uncle confronted him, popped out of the bushes, and said, what did you learn in school today? Now, you know, your kids might think it's bad enough when they have to answer that question at the dinner table, but when your uncle pops out of the bushes and asks you, what, what did you learn in school today? That's, that's pretty terrifying, especially when he's a heretic. <laughs> So, St. Peter Martyr, as a young boy, replied, well, we learned the symbol of faith, the creed, it's in the right frame of the creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And he, and he went on and rattled the whole, the whole creed off. And his uncle said, no, that's not true. There's a good God and a bad God. And so, you know, tried to persuade him from believing in all these things. But by some grace, he was kept free from, from buying in um, to all of these errors in his, that surrounded him in his early life. If it seems like we're, we're um, not giving you a good idea of what exactly this heresy believed, we're going to talk about it more in another lecture on St. Dominic and dualism. So it'll come up there. So right now, we just need to, to explain a little bit about the background of St. Peter Martyr's story. So St. Peter Martyr was sent to Bologna as a student. And he was preserved from all of the, well, um, things that afflict students, <laughs> um, being away from home for the first time. Uh, so, you know, while Bologna probably wasn't Ohio State University, it did have its temptations, um, even in the 13th century. And he eventually entered the Dominican order. And he progressed uh, and spent his life rooting out this heresy. And he was entrusted with a lot of responsibility. Um, and even to becoming a sort of preacher general, uh, responsible for this whole area, responsible for rooting out heresy in this whole area, was, was prior of some of his communities. Um, and so he was known by reputation. He, he started a uh, religious order in Florence. He also started a religious group. Uh, I guess we could draw a parallel with the Knights of Columbus or something. Um, it was called the Society, Society of the Faith. Um, so, these men uh, dedicated to, to preserving the faith in that area against heresy. So he was eventually targeted by heretics because he was pretty prominent. And, and he knew that uh, he, his name had been you know, mentioned by heretics and that they were sort of coming after him. And he even mentioned this in one of his uh, sermons at one point. But, so that's all, all the background. But I think the most interesting facts about him come on the last day of his life. After the Cathars had targeted him and hired assassins, who themselves weren't, weren't heretics, they were just assassins, um, they followed him. And St. Peter Martyr happened to, to pause to say Mass, because daily Mass wasn't common in that day, um, especially on the road. But probably by some inspiration, of the Holy Spirit, he decided to say Mass at that, at that point and, and, um, and, and to make his confession as well. And then, as he and two other Dominicans were walking along the road, they told stories of the martyrs. And, and you're like, oh, come on. Right before he's martyred, they're talking about the martyrs. That's so, like, cliche. They just added that later as a legend. But actually, one of the, uh, and of course, me reading it, that's sort of what I thought, too. Um, one of the, uh, probably the most exhaustive um, book on Peter Martyr, the most exhaustive study, um, is by this... Um, Scholar that's teaching in second university, but who studied Peter Martyr, and he um, he believes that some of these details these details are actually have, have a pretty solid. In addition to being useful as as um, saints' lives <coughs> details and legends, they're actually true because some of the the earliest documents that record this event, because it was eyewitness, he had companions there, have have these details. So they told stories of the martyrs. They sang the Victime, the, the Easter sequence, because it was the Easter season. It was the Saturday after Easter Sunday. Um, and so it's neat to think of these, uh, him basically 
being perfectly ready to become a martyr on the way. And eventually, um, so the two assassins that had been hired, one just got scared um, and decided he was going to just, just flee. Uh, but the other, probably angered by his friend's departure, is like, fine, I'm going to really do this thing. He jumped out of the bushes, we can imagine, um, and confronted Peter Martyr and his companion on the road and, um, and gave a lethal blow to Peter Martyr. And um, that's what's symbolized there, or what's uh, pictured in um, all the iconography of him, is this, this blow right down the skull. The uh, historian I read said it, it was something like a machete-like tool. So not a, not a pleasant thought, but it's good to know what he endured, <laughs> endured for the Lord. Um, and then he also, uh, the assassin also murdered Peter Martyr's companion and gave him wounds that he died from later. And uh, the most, I think, um, beautiful detail is that after Peter Martyr had received the wound, whether it was a wound to the head or, or where, um, his dying words um, were not ow, <laughs> were not um, give my books to Brother Joe Kim, you know. They were, they were, um, his dying words began with, into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. Obviously what our Lord said on the cross, according to Psalms. And then, with his last breath, he recited the creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He probably didn't get much further than that, given that this was his last breath. So, St. Peter Martyr is, is in particular a witness of the faith. Not only when he was a little boy did he tell his uncle what he had learned, but he kept that all through life, and even with his last breath, made that the point. Such a man of faith that, that his final words were the confession of the creed, because he was opposing this man who obviously had a competing understanding of the meaning of life. <laughs> and, and those heretics who had hired him who had a competing um, understanding of the meaning of life. And so uh, it's also fitting to know that there's some happy stories for other people, ha happy endings for, for other people involved, namely the murderer, who um, went to a Dominican convent, um, eventually made his confession, eventually became a Dominican, <laughs> um, and became a saintly Dominican lay brother. So uh, it's, it's good to know that that story had a happy ending. The, the, the one who had fled also ran away and made his confession to a Dominican. So it's part of the reason we have some of the good facts about this. Uh, so that's a little bit about St. Peter Martyr's life. And I think uh, it helps us to understand that not only did he have a clear understanding of the meaning of life, but he made a bold proclamation of it. That he wasn't, he wasn't afraid, even in the face of danger, to, to stand up and to say and to proclaim and to root out error and to, to show that, no, we are made for God, and we are made to be happy with Him, the good God who has made all things, and we are made to share in His life. One of the uh, other martyrs, the other martyr who actually had martyr as part of his name, um, came after they were martyred, I don't think they grew up like that, destined for murder. Um, St. Justin Martyr, who we, whose feast we had a few days ago, um, in the account, the sort of vivid account of his martyrdom, we have some dialogue between him and the person, uh, the, the prefect, the Roman prefect who was persecuting him. And we have this excellent, uh, excellent articulation right here. The prefect said, do you have an idea that after suffering all these torments, you will go up to heaven to receive some suitable rewards? And Justin, Justin Martyr said, it's not an idea that I have. It's something I know well and hold to be most certain. So I think this is in particular a witness in the face of a lot of folks who think that the meaning of life can't be known. Or that if you pretend to know it, you're, that's just a kind of vague notion you, you have. No, it's something we know by faith and can hold to be most certain. St. Peter Martyr blood shed his blood for the Lord. And this manifests that not only is the meaning of life something knowable and certain, but it's something we can declare boldly and continue to profess until our dying moments. 
He spends his last breath not in explanation of pain or condemnation of his attackers, or of issuing his will, give my books away to a different brother, um, but his last breath was spent on a final declaration of a creed, which I think is fitting because it shows just how he spent his whole life yearning to bring lost souls to see that their purpose is in God and happiness with Him. Now we know with certainty, with a faith that is a foretaste of the promise that is already being realized. Faith is a foretaste that allows us to already experience our true end. And so, it's fitting for us to keep that always before us, that notion of our last end, of happiness with God, knowing Him as He knows Himself, loving Him as He loves Himself, being intimately united to Him, He who is a communion of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to also ask ourselves, what will it look like? Because asking questions can lead us to have a greater, a greater hold of this hope that we have in store. To, to grab another quote uh, from Gerlou Lagrange on the beatific vision, such a vision will produce in us a love of God so strong, so absolute, that nothing can ever destroy it or even diminish it. It will produce a love built on admiration, respect, and gratitude, but above all on friendship with the simplicity and familiarity that this love presupposes. Through such a love we will enjoy above all else that God is God, that He is infinitely holy, infinitely merciful, infinitely just. It is a love that will make us adhere to all the decrees of His providence in view of His glory, urging us to subject ourselves to what pleases Him, so that He may reign eternally in us. Everlasting life for us will be to know God as He knows Himself, and to love Him as He loves Himself. And I just want to finish with one of my favorite quotes from, from Scripture, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, from Revelation, basically on the last page of the Bible. But it gives us uh, some imagery um, for the end times, and for the vision of God, from St. John. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. <clears throat>